Good morning, everyone. Jason here, and today we are going to learn how to create Blizzard-style hand-painted textures on a low-poly game model. But before we can begin, uh, let us quickly uh, cover two very important things. The first one is to understand what are some of the characteristics that makes a texture feels like the Blizzard style. And the second uh, would be the workflow for working with 3D models within Photoshop. Alright, here are five characteristics uh, that makes a texture feels like the Blizzard style. The first one, um, the design itself has very few or no straight lines at all. So let's take a look at this example. Uh, this is an artwork done by Tyson Murphy who used to work in Blizzard. Uh, here are some of his weapon designs for World of Warcraft, I believe. So as you can see here, uh, the weapon silhouette itself doesn't actually have a lot of uh, straight lines. In fact, uh, the, the whole design of this weapon feels very organic because uh, of how curvy uh, things look. The second characteristics for hand-painted textures will be that the lighting, shadow and ambient occlusion are actually painted into the albedo map. And usually in this uh, hand-painted textures, the artist will position the key light above the object. So using the same concept artwork from before, we can try and analyze how Tyson designed this weapon and how he intends the texture artist to paint this uh, weapon onto the 3D model. If we apply a uh, black and white filter over this image, we can see that the overall value of this image uh, gradates from uh, the top where it's lightest to the bottom where it's generally the darkest. The reason why we use hand-painted textures for low polygon models is because uh, we can fake lighting information, be it the uh, light source or the shadows that are generated from the lighting, with paint strokes uh, painted directly into the textures. This is so that we do not need to waste expensive engine resources on generating dynamic lighting uh, in a 3D game. Point number three, the dirt damage and cuts of these textures are usually overemphasized. We can see from this uh, particular concept art that there is rust, deep cuts and chips on the weapon to a point where the weapon looks unusable. Next, the textures usually have a very rich color palette. Using the same example we have of this axe, you can tell that additional colors are mixed in when painting this particular uh, texture on the axe. You can see that there's a hint of blue on this part of the metal texture and on the blue part, uh, you can see a little faint orange or reddish glow. And on the wooden areas, you can feel that there's a little bit of a green that is being mixed into the colouring. And lastly, the edges are emphasised in these textures using the same concept art of the X. We can uh, analyse certain areas where the edges are uh, highlighted with a lighter colour. Usually it's a colour that is close to white. And even on non-metallic parts such as the cloth right below the blade of the axe, you can tell that on the areas where the contour bends, you can see a lighter shade of red. This emphasis of the edges creates contrast and this brings about a lot of visual interest especially since the models will be quite small on the game screen. Alright, next I will do a brief introduction of the workflow of 3D texturing inside Photoshop. Now I must say that 
prior to this, uh, I'm kind of an old school, you know, texture artist in the sense that I will create a texture and I will import it into the 3D package, be it uh, 3D Studio Max or Maya, and I will actually use the 3D software to preview my textures. And I didn't actually know about this feature in Photoshop uh, until a friend of mine at work uh, told me that Blender has a similar function where you can paint your textures and you can preview them in real time uh, in a separate window within Blender. So I went to research a little bit and I realized that Photoshop has the same uh, functionality or the, the same features which allow you to do uh, just that. So without further ado, uh, let's head into Photoshop. Uh, I think this feature is available in CC and above. So this concept art I have over here is done by Charles Park and you can actually view the image in the link in the description box below. And basically I took this concept art and I modded uh, a simple low poly version of this uh, in 3D Studio Max. So after doing, after completing the model, I exported the model as a OBJ file. I believe you can have it as a 3ds file as well. It will work in Photoshop. So right now we will just drag this in and open. You will see a familiar new document dialog box over here. What you want is to create a big enough canvas where you can see the model being displayed on the screen. So for now, instead of A4, maybe I can do something along the lines of uh, something smaller, maybe something like uh, two thousand pixels by one thousand five hundred pixels. And we click OK, and Photoshop will open up this uh, 3D model, and it will ask you whether you want to switch to a 3D workspace. Just click yes. Basically, the 3D workspace is over here where you can uh, switch back to the default Photoshop UI. Uh, in this 3D workspace, you can actually uh, have the usual viewport controls as you would in any standard 3D package where you can orbit around this object, you can zoom in and out. The controls are, are all over here. You can you know, zoom in and out, you can uh, pan the camera, you can orbit around the object, so on and so forth. And notice here on the right hand side, instead of the default layers tab, you have the 3D tab. But the configuration of uh, the object itself is very similar to how it's laid out in the default uh, Photoshop layers tab. You can see uh, the information being displayed one above the other. One. So this concept art I have over here is done by Charles Park and you can actually view the image in the link in the description box below. And basically I took this concept art and I modded uh, a simple low poly version of this uh, in 3D Studio Max. After doing, after completing the model, I exported the model as a OBJ file. I believe you can have it as a 3ds file as well. It will work in Photoshop. So right now we will just drag this in and open. You will see a familiar new document dialog box over here. What you want is to create a big enough canvas where you can see the model being displayed on the screen. So for now, instead of A4, maybe I can do something along the lines of uh, something smaller, maybe something like uh, 2000 pixels by 1500 pixels. And we click OK. And Photoshop will 
open up this uh, 3D model and it will ask you whether you want to switch to a 3D workspace. Just click yes. Basically the 3D workspace is over here where you can uh, switch back to the default Photoshop UI. Uh, in this 3D workspace, you can actually uh, have the usual viewport controls as you would in any standard 3D package where you can orbit around this object, you can zoom in and out. The controls are, are all over here. You can you know, zoom in and out. You can uh, pan the camera. You can orbit around the object, so on and so forth. And notice here on the right hand side, instead of the default layers tab, you have the 3D tab. So with that out of the way, let's begin the exciting part, which is to create the texture. To select the textures, simply uh, navigate over here the, under the 3D panel. You can see uh, the name of your 3D object. For mine, it will be the sword. And if you click underneath the sword layer or the sword group, you will open up the material properties over here. Now, usually I would just uh, go in here and create a new texture and it will ask me about the texture size in which maybe I'll specify a bigger size uh, for this example, 2048 by 2048 and I'm click OK and it will actually create a new document uh, right beside the OBJ file with the unread information already done. So this unwrap information, you have to properly unwrap the 3D object for this to, appla uh, to appear on the document like this and you can easily hide the unwrap information uh, over here in this uh, properties panel. It actually doesn't exist as a layer by itself and you can also change the color, uh, toggle the opacity, so on and so forth. So it's uh, pretty useful when you are texturing to be able to see the unwrap information. And uh, to display these two information side by side, we will go to Window, Arrange, and select the two up vertical uh, orientation. So over here, you can see the texture file and over to your right side, you will see the uh, 3D model. So let's begin uh, doing some simple texturing. Uh, you can go to your mouse and you can create a new layer or you can use this existing layer. Uh, and let's say I want to fill in with a, hmm, let me think, 50% gray perhaps. And then I will do create a new layer above it. Select a paint brush, just a simple circle brush, and maybe select a red. Do some uh, blood stains on the on the sword. Maybe, you know, right now, I'm just painting with the mouse, but it's just to illustrate my point uh, that the that the update is done live, as you can see on the. Uh, model we have at the side. If we go back to the move to, you can pan around this thing and you can see that the blood scenes are actually updated in real time on the 3D model itself. And the beautiful thing is that you can actually in this panel or in this window, you can switch back to your paint brush and continue painting on the 3D model itself. Like how I would be doing now. And you notice back on your left hand side, uh, on the on the document of the uh, texture file, you can see that the update is done in real time. So it becomes very easy for you. For example, if uh, on this little gem over here, you want to be really really precise. You can uh, use your selection tools, let's say I were to uh, create this, it's not okay. Just 
show you. Okay, let's uh, just fill this with a orange color. Foreground color. Alright, let me go back here. We'll see that it becomes orange, but what if, you know, I want an exact pattern over here. size of the brush to be a little bit smaller you know I can actually be very precise uh, over here again you can go back to your camera controls you can actually zoom in so that it becomes a little bit more precise you can pan the camera switch back to your paintbrush and to ensure that you know you're painting accurately Maybe you want something like this. It becomes very easy uh, for you to lay down certain patterns uh, that you want on your textures. So this is a, a, a great way to work uh, when you are laying down initial textures. For me, again, as I mentioned, I am more of the old school types. Uh, after this initial phase, I personally would still prefer to uh, just view and work on the the texture uh, document by itself because it allows me to have a little bit more space. I can you know fit in more windows by my uh, by the side, which you will see later on during the time lapse uh, recording of the creation of the textures. Um, but for now, I think it's a pretty uh, useful tool to lay down the initial design of how you want the textures to be. So uh, one question is, uh, how do I save this file, right? So let us just uh, zoom out the model again. And to save the texture is very easy. You just uh, have to just go through the, the default uh, way of uh, saving your textures. Let me just uh, save it. Maybe something. By default, uh, somehow it defaults to the PSD format. You can uh, go back to the, the usual PSD format and maybe I will do a sort underscore diff2 and save it. Okay. Now once you save it, you can close it. Uh, you notice that this is still, still on. Uh, and say you're, you know, you're done with the session, you want to uh, switch off your computer, uh, and you want to close everything, it asks you whether you want to save the file, you can say no. And the next time when you load back this uh, OBJ file, you'll notice that the, the textures are missing again. So before you freak out, you know, a simple way to uh, load back the textures, the work in progress that we have from before. You click back over here under the sword group. You can select over here, replace textures, and you just select the one that you have and voila, it's back. To edit the textures again, you just have to go back to the same uh, layer and you select edit textures, the document will reappear. So for today's time-lapse video, uh, I'll be showing you the process in which I uh, paint up the textures. Just quickly show you the end result before we begin. Uh, replace textures, this one. So this is the end result we are looking at uh, and I'll show you how I uh, reach this step. Edit textures, you can see over here. You know how I, how I uh, painted this lizard style hand painted textures. So enjoy. So. All right, so I be forgot to record the start of my process, so we just have to start from here. Uh, but basically, the first thing I did was to create shape layers uh, based on the individual colors 
uh, of the design. So for example, the grey on the metal will be its own shape, the gold uh, on the weapon will be its own shape, the red uh, cloth area on the handle uh, will be its own shape, and the brown part on the blade will be its own shape, so on and so forth. Uh, basically, this helps to streamline the process later with the help of a uh, clipping mask uh, on the shape layers. So once I've done that, uh, next I would actually mark out the shadow areas using another shape layer that is set to multiply. And usually I, I prefer to use the shape layers instead of using the paintbrush or using uh, lasso tool, uh, simply because it is easier to edit later, the shape, uh, if it's somehow drawn wrongly. I can just shift the anchor points around to edit my shape. So it, it provides a lot of uh, flexibility uh, for this process. Again, I'm only uh, using this uh, 3D view for the initial layout of the colors. As you can see, it's quite uh, useful to have a live uh, feedback on on the colors that you uh, when, when you are you know laying down the the original colors that you need. So again, just uh, selecting areas where I think uh, should be in shadow. Typically, if you are doing a realistic uh, kind of texturing, you will not want shadow information. But because we are doing it the blizzard style, we want to paint in the shadows and the ambient occlusions. Yeah, I'm just uh, laying down some patterns, some grooves that we will paint in, uh, we will detail later. And this is the part where it really really helps to have a live update when you're creating your artwork. It's really very uh, efficient to be able to see the position or the location of the designs that you have laid out to check in real time if they are in the right place or if you need to further edit them. So for the boats on the side of the the weapon, I've actually used a uh, blending mode to create a uh, shadow, a drop shadow on it. So right now I'm, uh, you know, going into painting mode and I've basically closed the 3D preview because uh, for one thing I'm actually working uh, on this part uh, in my home computer and I, I'm still using a CS6 so I don't have that feature but uh, at the same time I'm actually, I actually don't need that feature when I'm painting I usually uh, like to have more references on the screen so I really don't have the real estate to display any more information than what you see here. So right now I'm just uh, doing just a very quick initial pass laying down different colors as I mentioned in the uh, PowerPoint earlier about adding in you know random blues and oranges to and greens even uh, to really create a very rich looking color palette on this weapon. So it's a mixture of the uh, color blending mode, the multiply uh, blending mode to really you know create a, a interesting looking uh, assortment of colors. I'm also 
adding in uh, additional ambient occlusion using uh, the gradient tool. And right now I'm just uh, adding in the edges. Again, as mentioned during the PowerPoint, the edges uh, tend to be overemphasized. So right now I'm using a white to go over the areas where there are supposed to be sharp edges. So once this uh, initial pass is laid in, uh, that's where the fun really comes in. Uh, you get to really explore the different types of materials and try to paint them as realistic as possible. Uh, if you find difficulty uh, painting the materials in, for example, getting metal to look like metal, getting gold to look like gold, I would suggest you do a little bit more material studies before you attempt this this um, this assignment. But yeah, basically from here on out, uh, it's more of a grindy process where I just zoom in and try to work out each individual part, try to make it as uh, interesting as possible. Uh, but yeah, I'll uh, leave you with some music and uh, I'll see you at the end.
Rocky.
you have it, the completed textures on the model. Uh, one last thing to note when you are previewing this in your 3D package, do remember to switch off the default lighting or set it to a flat lighting so that it will show up a little bit more accurately. And uh, that's about it. I hope you have learned something uh, during this video and I'll see you next time.